good timing. Welcome back. How you doing? Doing really good, really good, really good. Really good, really good, good, awesome. Well, the past few sessions, we have been talking all about the triangles, all about that shape. It's a song, I could sing, no, anyway. Um, so we've been talking about triangles, and we ended the last conversation talking about how to use angle measures and side measures um, in triangles to say which side and which angle was bigger. We're going to set aside the triangles for a moment and pick up the last little bit of proofs that we still have left. We've done direct proofs so far. Two column proofs, I hand you the given, you start the given, you use a bunch of definitions and theorems and postulates and properties to somehow navigate your way down to the conclusion, the thing you're wanting to prove. And this all seemed very straightforward. You're getting fairly okay with it. Not going to say everyone is 100% perfect on it because I'm not 100% perfect on writing those kind of proofs. You guys are making some headway to getting better. Now we're going to go the opposite direction. We're going to do the indirect proof. The indirect proof is going to feel very much like we're going backwards. Instead of starting with the given, we're going to start with the conclusion. But we're not just going to grab the conclusion as it is. We're going to temporarily assume that that conclusion, the thing we want to prove, is false. And then we're going to go through and we're going to show that that assumption is completely wrong. And the moment we can show that that assumption is completely wrong, we've proven that the original conclusion the one we started with was true. And I see the looks on your faces, which is the exact same look that I gave my college professor when they first told me about this. I went, what? This is like the backwards days argument. Okay? You're having an argument with someone, and they're just going on and on. You're like, okay, let's assume for a moment what you said was true, <laughs> even though you know they're completely wrong. Right? Have you done that to a friend? All right, we're going to assume what you said is true. And then you go in and you show that by having that one thing true, it makes things just a complete mess. And it ends up saying something stupid and they totally agree with you that that thing sounded really dumb. Have you done that to your friends before? All the time. All the time? You have done an indirect proof, my dear. Because then you go, ah, you see, you agree with me, that's stupid. That means that this thing, which we agreed was, was right, it's wrong which means I'm right and you're wrong, right? Okay. When you do this, this is an indirect proof. It can also be called a proof by contradiction. You know what the word contradiction means? It's when you say something that goes against what you said earlier. That? It's like being a hypocrite. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. The big old lie, the big old hypocritical moment. Yep. Oh, you liked my, my big word there, did you? Hypocritical. Yes, hypocritical. A big word. Indirect reasoning and indirect proof you have used in your everyday situations and conning your friends into thinking your way. It can also be used to prove statements in geometry. There's just one thing, however, that you have to remember. And that is that the contradiction that you're trying to get to doesn't always have to contradict the given information or any of the assumptions that you're making. You can have it contradict a well-known fact or some sort of definition that you and whomever you were arguing with have agreed on as a good definition. You've done these in your arguments before. There are only three steps for writing a formal indirect proof, and they are assume that the conclusion is false by assuming that the opposite is true. We'll assume, friend, that what you said is true. We all know that you're not, but we're going to assume that it's true. Then you're going to show that that assumption leads to some sort of contradiction whether it be a contradiction in one of the hypotheses that you two have agreed upon or some other factor definition. 
then you have to point out that that assumption was false. And then add, therefore, the original conclusion, conclusion must be true. Okay, let's practice writing some assumptions with if-then statement conclusions. All right, where is our conclusion? For all the numbers. We're looking at number one? A, B, X is greater than seven. X is greater than seven would be the conclusion because that's the stuff that comes after the word then. So we are going to make the opposite of that. Assume the opposite of x is bigger than 7. What is the opposite of x is bigger than 7? You're not wrong. But we need more. x is less than or equal to 7. Because strictly speaking, the opposite of x is greater than 7 is x is not greater than 7. And in order to get it's not greater than, it needs to be smaller than or equal to. Because equal to is not bigger than it. It is equal to. So we want x is not greater than 7 or x is less than or equal to 7. Alright, for all real numbers, what are the real numbers? Do you remember? Okay. Um, whole numbers. Whole numbers. Uh, those are not real numbers. Real whole numbers are inside of the real numbers, so oh, they real contain them. Anything, yeah, real numbers is anything. Uh, well, we have to be more specific than just anything. So, rational. yeah, we've got uh, fractions are okay. We've got decimals are okay. Uh, we've got whole numbers are okay. No uh, positives and negatives are okay. Oh. Zero is okay. Um, we can't have, oh yeah, we can have the irrationals, can't we? Yeah. Irrationals are okay. Um, I don't know if we can have the transcendentals. Transcendental numbers are the ones that are decimals and they repeat forever and there's no pattern and you just, uh. Like pi? Yeah. Like pi. They're just, uh, number. Okay, so for all of these kinds of numbers, if a plus b is bigger than c, then a is bigger than c minus b. What's the conclusion? A is greater than c minus b. Beautiful, and so what are we going to assume? <coughs> a is not greater than c minus b. A is not greater than c minus b, which means we're going to write this as a is? Equal to or less than equal to or less than C minus B, which we, common, we more commonly say is less than or equal to. Easy peasy? Easy peasy. All right. Let's try our first proof of this before we go back and keep um, writing assumption statements. So here's our first proof. They wanted to complete it as an indirect proof. Notice this looks almost like a cross between a two column and a paragraph proof. You'll find that a lot in direct proofs. They don't have to be two column. They don't have to be paragraph. It can be some sort of blend between the two, as however looks neat for you and makes you get it to make sense. All right, given n is an integer. All right, what's an integer? Negative or positive whole numbers. Negative or positive whole numbers. I love it, thank you. Positive or negative whole numbers. Lovely. And then it isn't a thing that I have created unless there is a typo. That should be n squared, not n2. So please make that change. Thank you very much. All right. So n is some sort of whole number, positive or negative. No one cares. And when you square it, you get an even number. We need to prove that the number that you're squaring, n, is also even. We're going to do this by an indirect proof, so the first thing we need to assume is n is odd. N is odd. 
and is not an even number. In order for it to not be even, it has to be odd. When it's odd, we can express odd numbers this way. Two times some number, then add one to it. We'll think about that for a second. Think right now. Think of a number. Don't say anyone. Don't tell anyone. Think of a number. You got a number? Yes. Multiply by two. Okay. Now add one. Okay. Do you have an odd number? Yes. yes. All right. Change the number. Multiply it by two. Add one. Still odd? Yes. yes. All right. What numbers did y'all think of? Five, what numbers three, do you have? Six, five, three, uh, seven, eight. Lunch bell. Seven, two. two. Did anyone think of negatives? No. That's okay. You didn't have no, to. Basic. But you, <laughs> that's okay. But you notice how all of you were thinking of different numbers, and you all kept getting the same result. Odd, odd, odd. Let's do a negative number now. Let's think of a negative. Think of a negative. Okay, is it still odd? Yes. Awesome. Okay. This is because this way of writing the number is the definition of what it means to be an odd number. Cool. And now we can start substituting. Instead of n, we can write this definition. So I can write 2a plus 1 as a group is being squared, because that is n squared. Okay, let's run through the algebra. Multiply just means I'm going to multiply them together, so I'm not actually going to do the multiplication yet. I am just going to write, hey, I need to do some multiplication. And now I'm going to do my distribution. Here's how I'm going to keep track of what I've multiplied, because I need to multiply everything by everything else. So I'm going to multiply these two things first. <coughs> 2a times 2a is 4a squared. I'm going to add to that whatever I get when I multiply this first one here by this second one here. 2a times 1 is 2a. I'm going to add to that whatever I get when I multiply this second term by this first term. 1 times 2a is 2a. And then I'm going to add to that the final multiplication, those two terms, 1 times 1 is 1. You likely learned this with the little rainbows or the headphones or the little arcs. I didn't have the room here with the way I was writing to do that, so I used colored dots. No one cares how you keep track of how you multiply. As long as you do, everyone is happy. Okay. So follow the, num the colors again. I multiplied the red dots. I wrote the answer in red. Multiplied the orange, write the answer in orange. Multiplied the greens, multiplied the blues. Are we good with my notation? Yep. Awesome. The next step says to simplify, so I'm going to take the line that I wrote off to the right. Use the 700 hall, please. Thank you. And I'm going to simplify. The only simplification I can see of to do is to take these two and add them together. So that's what I'm going to do, and everything else I'm going to leave exactly the same. Now we're going from 4a squared plus 4a plus 1 to 2 times this big jumble of stuff plus 1. But let's look at the big jumble of stuff. 2 times this first piece is 4a squared, this thing. And 2 times the second group of stuff is 4a. If I were to distribute that line statement number 8, I'd get back to number 7. So we basically just use the distributive property, but in a way that feels like it, we did it in reverse. When you hit Algebra 2, this is called factoring. Okay? So anytime you see something like this, we've done some factoring. But notice how this got written. Two times a bunch of jumbly stuff of numbers plus one. This is just a single number, isn't it? I don't know what that number is. 
but no one cares. It's a number, right? Two times some number, add one. What kind of number do you get out? You get out an odd number. Let's zoom out a second. What was the second thing we were given? That it's even. This, remember, was n squared the whole way down. We have given n squared is even, but we just proved that n squared is odd. We have a contradiction. It can't be odd if we already know it's even. We just broke something. Probably your head. Mind blown. But that means that the original assumption that we started off with up here where we said n is odd, it's false. Because the moment we say n is odd, it turns n squared odd. But n, squ n squared is already even. Contradiction. That means then that n has to be even. Feeling okay with this? Yeah. Okay. When I post this one, and I'll show it to you when we're done with the notes, I want to show you a video. Um, one of my favorite math, musician, artist, YouTubers, she does a proof, Pythagorean theorem, that's an indirect proof that does the same thing. And I want to share it with you because it's fun. And I think ending the day on a video is always a good way to end the day. Yes? Okay, and then I'll link it when I post this lecture video to my channel. I'll link it in the description thing. As I point down and no one else can see me, but you guys will get me. All right, if this were the conclusion, if this were the thing we're trying to prove, how would I write this as an assumption to start an indirect proof? It does not, right? You just make it the opposite. That's all you're doing. If BD bisects, then we're going to assume that it does not bisect. Beautiful. RT is equal to TS. The um, indirect proof assumption would be? RT is not equal. Yep, RT is not equal to TS. Here's how you write RT not equal to TS. Ready? Color red optional. You don't have to put the color red through it. I emphasis. like it. Yeah, emphasis. I like it, the not. Like, it makes you go, oh, it's wrong. All right, let's do some physics. Who's taking physics? <laughs> Who's going to take physics? That's pretty much most of us, yeah. Yeah, if you're in the AP track, which this class is, you are likely going to be taking physics. If you have the opportunity to take physics for college credit here in high school right now, please do it. Please, please, please. You have to take at least two science credit in college, depending on like whatever your major is, you still have to take at least two college credits. So that's physics one and physics two at the high school level. Um, I did not, I was in physics for two weeks. I was like, no, I think I wanna do band now. So I switched my schedule, I took band, I played oboe, um, and I didn't get, and then I had to take physics in college and it was like super crazy weird hard and I failed my first semester of physics in college, and I had to take it again. So please, if you have the chance to try it here, do it. All right, so let's do some physics. Sound waves travels through the air at about 344 meters per second. So that you have an idea of how big that is, because here in the United States, we don't think in meters. Look at our floor tiles. Those floor tiles are about a foot long each, a meter is a little more than three feet. So a meter is a little more than three of the floor tiles that you're looking at right now. Okay? That's one meter. Sound travels 344 of those groups of little more than three every second. That's really, really fast. But it does this at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. I don't know about you, but I don't think of my degrees in Celsius. Do you? A few of you do, and if you do, you're amazing and you're awesome. My brain does not work this way. How much? 
You said 74. Okay, we're going to check that in a second. I have here my weather bug, um, and I have a bunch of different cities queued up. Um, let's see if I can find a good city. Ooh, Harlingen is... Here we go, San Antonio. That looks like a great city. My dad is lives in San Antonio, so that's what I have. It's 59 degrees currently in San Antonio. Look at that. They're going all the way down into the 40s to by tomorrow morning. Yikes. Okay, so anyway, I'm going to push the menu and go to settings and then change my units from Fahrenheit to Celsius. And then my weather bug tells me 15 degrees. Okay. Well, I want 20. 28. So somewhere between, fifth, what was it in San Antonio, 50-something? Mm -hmm. So somewhere between 50-something in San Antonio at 15 degrees and 80-something at 28 degrees is your 20. So 20 is probably somewhere in the 70s, right, where you said it was. Nice guess. All right, so 20 degrees is about 70 Fahrenheit, which is what it was this morning. So think back to this morning when you got out of the car or out of your house, you went to the bus, right? You're imagining it, you're feeling it? 70 degrees. Sound travels 344 of those group of three tiles and a little bit more every second in air as cold as it was this morning. As cool as it was this morning? Okay. Enrique, our good friend Enrique, he lives two kilometers from a fire station. What's a kilometer? Like something bigger than a mile. Something like a mile? Bigger. Bigger? A kilometer is a thousand meters. One meter is about three of these feet, right? Three of our tiles. Which means a kilometer is about 3,000 feet. I think a kilometer is like a mile. Uh, it's, it's a little less than a mile. Yeah, it's like a mile and a half is like two kilometers. Because a mile is. 5,000-ish feet, and one kilometer is about 3,000-ish feet. So it's a little more than half a mile. All right, we're good? Okay, so he lives two kilometers, maybe about a mile and a quarter, mile and a half away from the fire station, and it takes five seconds for him to hear the sound of the fire station siren when he's at his house. This means that he's at his house, he's got his buddy at the fire station, they're on the phone, his friend goes, okay, I'm gonna ring the bell in three. And he goes, oh, I got my timer. Two, all right, I'm ready. One, okay, right, click. And then as soon as it, he went, one, go, and he just started his timer. And then he listened, and as soon as he heard the siren, he turned his timer off and five seconds had passed. How can we prove indirectly that it is not 20 degrees outside, 70 to us here in Texas, when he hears the siren? Because he would have used it earlier. Or later? Or something? Like, how do we know? Indirect proof. That's our hint. Indirect proof. For an indirect proof, we're going to take the conclusion. Our conclusion is that it's not 20. And we're going to look at the opposite. It is 20. It's 20 degrees outside when Enrique hears the siren. If it's 20 degrees outside, then that means that the sound waves are going to travel 344 meters per second. And they're going to do that for five seconds. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Who's going to the 700 hall? They asked for that today. So I'm going to multiply these two values. All right, I did something weird with the units, didn't I? I wrote it weird, yes? I wrote them as fractions, and oh my god, your hearts are starting to panic. I did this for a reason, because now I can think of just multiplying the numbers, and then I can think of just multiplying the units. And if I think of multiplying the units this way, I see that the seconds are the same in both top, the numerator, and bottom, the denominator. And whenever that happens, I can cancel them. And this leaves me with a units 
of meters and I don't have to worry about oh my god what's the unit when I take meters per second and multiply by seconds and I don't remember I don't have to remember I do this it tells me and now I need 344 times 5 and this is when I go to my calculator because I don't know 1,560 1, is what he's saying. 720? 1,720? 1,720, we got it all together. We had to help each other, but that is okay. All right, this means that in 20 degree weather, sound traveling 344 meters per second, if the sound reached him in five seconds, Enrique had to be 1,720 meters away from the siren. Is he? No. How far away is Enrique? Two, two, two kilometers. He is 2,000 meters away from the siren. Are these equal? No. So it is not 20 degrees outside. Because if it were 20 degrees in five seconds, he'd have to be 1,720 meters. He's not. He's 2,000. Temperature's got to be something else. I don't know what it is. I don't care what it is. I just care that it's not 20. Well, 70 to us here in Texas, right? Yes? All right. There's one more proof to do. I would love to do one more proof with you because I know that these indirect proofs, they're kind of backwards. Either they're backwards and it feels so much easier than the direct proofs we've been doing this entire time. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot of you. And that's okay. Or the indirect proofs are making you go, what the bird bowl? I don't know what's going on. All right? Is that some of you too? Like the indirect proofs are weird? That's okay. It just means that your brains don't work like mine. That's fine. Because <laughs> indirect proofs are hard for me. My brain isn't wired to handle this. But if your brains can handle this, you're awesome. <laughs> All right. Which one do you want to do? One, two, or three? Three. Three. Oh, I was afraid you'd say that one. <laughs> I was working on it uh, during the break during my lunch just to make sure I, I knew what was going on. Because indirect proofs are hard, so I have to work at them. And I didn't finish. <laughs> So, um, well, we can do two if you want. it's okay. Well, I've done two a couple times. I, I'm okay let's too. Yeah, let's let's figure, let's make a mess. Okay, we're told the measure of angle C is 100. So I'm gonna label that. That's 100 degrees. I was told, and then I want to prove that angle A is not a right angle. So I'm totally gonna start by saying it is. Let us assume that angle A is a right angle. Okay, from that I know that the measure of angle A equals 100. Ah, it equals 90. Sorry, right? Okay. All right, we're okay so far? Can you see where it's breaking? I think I see where it's breaking too. The measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B plus the measure of angle C needs to equal 180 by the triangle angle sum. That weird funky E is me abbreviating the word sum because I am clearly too lazy to write three letters. Is that really sum? It really is. It's the Greek letter sigma, capital sigma. But sigma and sum have the same letter sound for us, and so mathematicians have borrowed this letter from ancient Greece. They still use it today, so it's really kind of modern Greece. Um, anyway, they've borrowed this letter from Greece, from the Greeks, and have used it to say, we're adding up a bunch of stuff. So that's my shortcut for I'm too lazy to write the word sum. So I'm going to write that simple. Okay, so by the triangle angle sum, if I add them all up, I get to 180. Okay, 90 plus the measure of angle B plus 100 is going to be bigger than 180. 
contradiction. Which contradicts the triangle angle sum. Again, I wrote a symbol for angle because I was too lazy to write the word. If the symbols freak you out, write the word. I just, I'm lazy. Okay, good. Therefore, angle A is not a right angle. It's something else. Don't care? Don't know. I just care that it's not a right angle because that's what I'm trying to prove. Oh, that one was easier than I thought it was going to be. I was super nervous. I really was. You're absolutely right. I needed to have chilled. I didn't chill during lunch. I was freaking out. Thank you very much. That's all I have for you today.